Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I should say. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Let's get started. Uh, it's so exciting to see such a large audience with us today. Um, my name is Frank Costanzo. I am Vice President with Springer Publishing. I'm your host today for a webinar titled uh, Medical Cannabis for Healthcare Professionals. And uh, we expect this webinar to last about 40 minutes. Feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will attempt to answer the questions as we move through the presentation, and we'll also set aside some, questions, some time for questions at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and all participants will receive a link to the recording following the webinar. And at the web end of the webinar, uh, we'll provide you with some information regarding some significant savings that we'll be offering for books and online courses uh, that we'll be discussing during the webinar. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce you to one of our primary presenters, Chris Nazarinas, who is the CEO and founder of Medical Marijuana 411. Chris is also the author of the recently published book titled Medical Cannabis for Healthcare Professionals. Chris Nazarinas successfully built the medical cannabis uh, education leader by developing highly accredited online courses for healthcare professionals based on years of in-depth research and peer-reviewed studies on medical cannabis. Chris was initially motivated by a patient in her family who was positively impacted by cannabis use, and she's devoted more than 10 years to developing the most comprehensive cannabis education programs worldwide. Uh, uh, Chris has also worked extensively with government officials to provide education regarding medical cannabis, and as a result, the Medical Marijuana 401 one courses are certified and required by more U.S. states than any other company. Uh, Chris's company, Medical Marijuana 401, is the leader in cannabis education, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have Chris with us here this morning. Hi, Chris. Hi. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. It's fantastic. And welcome, everybody. It's exciting to have so many people interested in the topic of medical cannabis, cannabis and opioids. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because this really is uh, not only a U.S. conversation, but a global conversation. Um, I'm so proud to be working with Springer uh, with this opportunity. Uh, it's exciting to see a major medical publisher really step up to be first to look at cannabis as medicine. So that's something that I'm extremely proud of. Uh, so before we jump in, I thought I would give you guys a quick overview of what to expect today. Um, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. Uh, I want to make sure that you understand kind of where I came from and that we've been working on medical marijuana and our education for more than 11 years. We'll then uh, go to Dr. Greg Smith. He is the author of the uh, Fast Pack title on cannabis and opioids. He'll discuss some of the science of why cannabis is being used as an option for medicine, why it's decreasing the opioid uh, situation in our country, uh, we'll go into the differences of THC and CBD. We'll also go into the minor cannabinoids. It's interesting that there's 131 smaller pieces of the plant called minor cannabinoids. We'll go into some of the patient-centered dosing, also talk about side effects. It's not a perfect medicine. And then as Frank alluded to, we'll uh, open it up for some questions and we'll have an opportunity for some product specials. The one of the things I'm most proud about with Springer Publishing is the Medical Cannabis Handbook for Healthcare Professionals. This handbook, next Frank, if that works, um, is just, it's, it's unlike anything else out there in the market. Springer really stepped up to the plate to become first with uh, medical marijuana and created this gorgeous handbook. Um, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I know how to take research and put it together so peer-reviewed, unbiased uh, research is the basis for this handbook. We go into relative uh, contraindications, how to medicate, uh, advantages and disadvantages of the ways to medicate, getting cannabis into the bloodstream. We also talk about the FDA-approved cannabinoid medications because there are five. There's gorgeous graphics, which we also have created infographic posters. Um, but it's 275 pages, peer-reviewed research, about the science behind cannabis and how it works within our system. So a little bit about our mission. Um, 
our goal has always been to be a global leader. Uh, we want medical professionals and patients to have access to peer-reviewed, accredited, accurate, and insightful educational content and information in order to make an informed decision if cannabis might be an option for their health. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So one of the things that's our foundation is to make sure it's accredited and peer reviewed research studies. It's not something that you're just going to find on the internet. And we also try to make sure that we're very unbiased to let the medical professional and the patient make that decision of is cannabis an option for their own health? And is it something for a medical professional to recommend for a patient based on the research? Next. So why is it so important for us to focus on the medical community? It comes down to patient safety. I think when you look at these stats, it's pretty mind blowing that only 9% of medical schools have a medical cur curriculum uh, around medical marijuana. 85% of physicians and medical professionals feel they are not prepared to recommend cannabis and 65% do not feel prepared to answer questions from patients about medical cannabis. So it lends the, the, the question in your mind, who are your patients talking to? The front facing person uh, in a dispensary, the consultant, or sometimes it's called a bud tender, uh, is the person that's giving them uh, information by law. And this is with one of the other things that we talk about and teach in our consultant trainings is that they're not allowed to give medical advice. So they're not replacing what you do, but they certainly are the front facing person. And it's interesting that we've got to change that uh, conversation to allow health providers to be able to talk to their patients about cannabis. Next. So we didn't just come about in the last year or two, we were founded in 2009. Um, again, Frank alluded to that it was because of a patient story, my brother who had been using cannabis for his arthritis, uh, that it was kind of the aha moment for me. The bigger aha moment was for me was when my mother uh, at 83 years old got a cannabis medical card in Colorado so she could use topicals for her hands. And what I would see is that within 15 minutes, she'd find relief from the pain of her arthritis and she could knit and crochet. And all of a sudden her, her positively, you know, was impacted uh, by this, by a, a lotion that she rubbed on her hands. My mom certainly wasn't getting high. She was using something that uh, penetrated through the skin level. Um, as we grew, we became state certified in Washington. We then uh, our primary focus has been to author ACCME accredited courses. Uh, we are approved by the American Medical Association for an online category one course, which was almost unthinkable. It took four years of effort to get approved. Uh, as you know, or may not know, I've, so cannabis is a schedule one drug. By definition, that means it has no medicinal value and it's highly addictive. So to get uh, an ACCME, AMA accredited program through was just monumental. Next. So after we have the category one AMA approval, uh, we really pushed that we knew that there were other medical professionals that needed to have education around cannabis. So those courses are also approved by the ACPE for pharmacists. Uh, the ANCC for nurses, which I think we have a large audience of nurses here. So uh, we want to make sure that we, that you also have the opportunity to get CE credits, um, but also learn about medical cannabis. Uh, where we started was in Washington. I happened to be at the right place at the right time about seven years ago. Um, I was listening in an audience to Christy Weeks, who was the Department of Health uh, chair for the cannabis program here in Washington State, and she outlined that education would be a requirement for consultants in the state of Washington. Um, so we are one of three approved companies. We're the only online company. We're now approved uh, for both medical professional training, consultant training in multiple states, and have several pending everywhere from New York, Pennsylvania, Utah. I've been asked to work with New Jersey, on uh, policy, uh, Connecticut, uh, et cetera. So it's something that we align ourselves very uh, quickly and, we, and to align with government. We are expanding globally. My goal is to be the global leader. And right now we are leading that charge. We have our, our courses translated into Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Japanese is in the works. We're also going to Israel, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Europe. 
Uh, we have over 5,000 medical professionals that have taken our courses. Uh, we strive to be a compliance company. We want to make sure that we're working alongside government uh, policy and medical professionals to make sure, again, we go to that unbiased peer-reviewed research base for our courses. Our ultimate goal, patient safety. At this point, I would like to turn over the floor to Dr. Greg Smith. Uh, we have referred to him fondly as Dr. Greg, and I'm incredibly proud to have him on our board, and he's been the overseeing chair for our ACCM act activities. He has 30 years in clinical practice. He is board certified in preventative medicine, MPH for Harvard University, and 20 years practicing with medical cannabis. And I bet you, similar to most of you here, that it's one patient that started the conversation with you that made you start thinking, is this really a real option? Uh, he also has published two textbooks and two patient education books on cannabinoid therapeutics, two studies on clinical application of can cannabinoids, and with Springer Publishing, he is the author of The Fast Facts About Medical Cannabis and Opioids, Minimizing Opioid Use Through Cannabis. Dr. Gray? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, my headset's working this time? Yes, it is. Great, great. great. Um, so uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank Springer Press because I think it was a big jump uh, to recognize a cannabinoid therapeutics uh, by, uh -oh. by such a prestigious uh, publisher. So thank you. Am I there? Yes. For a moment, I thought we might lose you, but I can jump in, so you got Okay, I'm up. still here, yeah, okay. <laughs> yep, I'm still there, right? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Um, so again, I'm happy to be here. I'd like to st start out with a little uh, anecdotal story. Um, my dad was a pediatric geneticist um, and sort of was at the beginning of genetics back in the 50s and 60s. And when he started learning about cannabinoid cannabinoids and their efficacy, and he started reading some of my books and, and some of the articles, he said, Greg, th this is like antibiotics were in the 1950s. So uh, that, that's literally how important these cannabinoids are. This is a whole new area of medicine, and we're going to keep uh, taking the layers off the onions and finding the minor cannabinoids and combining the cannabinoids and the terpenes and like antibiotics and, and have a huge impact on how we treat patients into the future. So this is not just a new topic, this is a whole new area of medicine. Um, and you're gonna learn in the next uh, 30 minutes why these cannabinoids are so important in so many different disease processes. Uh, another thing I wanna highlight before we get into details is that a recent Boston Globe article said that 14% of adults in the United States are now using CBD regularly. So that is a huge percentage of our population are using uh, a cannabinoid, CBD, a safe cannabinoid, uh, but there's no training, uh, very little training going on in medical schools. And so here all these people are using it and uh, we want our healthcare providers to understand how it interacts and how it, it, it affects work. And since we aren't, we aren't taught the endocannabinoid system in medical school or nursing school. Um, so let's let's also say that there are already uh, four FDA approved cannabinoids available at your local CVS or Walgreens. Yeah, they're, they're out there. Some of them have been out there since the 80s. So uh, they have been recognized by the FDA as, a, as eff efficacious for a whole variety of medical conditions. The Institutes of Medicine in 2017 released a 400 page document describing 11 clinical therapeutic effects of cannabinoids. So, um, and we're, and probably this year or maybe next, we're gonna have a brand new cannabinoid, which is Sativex, uh, which is a combination of THC and CBD extracted from the plant. So, so we're gonna have a plant extract that will be available at your local pharmacy, not at a dispensary, but at your CVS, your Walgreens, wherever you go to. So we got to know about these medicines. We had to know what the system that they work with. Uh, so here we are at a glance. This is a lot of areas when we look at seizure control, anxiety, bronchodilation. Uh, I'll let you guys read the slide. So how can one series of medications affect so many conditions, many in the brain, many psychiatric, and then a whole diverse group from cancers to stomach disease to pain? 
And the reason why is the endocannabinoid system is the brakes for all the other systems in the body. And we're gonna go into a little more detail about what I mean by the brakes. But so the, the system is specifically designed to interplay when there's too much activity, the system is overactive. And so, um, and a lot of disease processes are overactive, especially too much inflammation, uh, too much pain response, um, too much ex excitation, and for example, with seizures. So uh, we're gonna learn, uh, how, and this is why, so it affects all these conditions. I'm probably ready for the next slide. So the endocannabinoid system, which will be abbreviated ECS uh, from here on, was, um, was really discovered in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. We, we knew about THC. We even knew about CBD back to 1940. We knew THC from the 1960s. We actually uh, identified it. Do Dr. Mishulam, there's his photograph there. He is, he is the founding father of, of cannabinoid medication and therapeutics. Um, so we discovered THC, CBD, uh, but we didn't have a system in the body that it worked on. And so I was out of med school and probably uh, half of the medical professionals that are practicing these days were out of med school when this stuff was being discovered. Uh, so uh, it works both in the brain, the endocannabinoid system, it, ha it has about a dozen centers in the brain and only those centers. So it doesn't work throughout the brain, but only specific centers in the brain. And then it's in almost every organ system of the body, cardiovascular, pulmonary, endocrine, uh, for fertility, uh, pain. So it, it's diffuse throughout the body and, and only specific in the brain. It is the most common uh, messaging system in the brain. It is more common than serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine uh, in the brain, and the second most common messaging system in the body. So this is a very important brand new system that we really need to learn about. We have had our research limited in clinical, clinical research, which means when we do it in humans, has been severely limited since the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, put the plant cannabis sativa into schedule one along with um, heroin and PCP. So because of that, uh, almost all of the limited NIH studies that were done for decades were done to show the damage caused by cannabis use. So we have very, very little studies going on to show how it's efficacious or therapeutic, but just how it's damaging. Uh, until uh, we get, in the past decade especially, uh, the, the laws first get passed in California in 1996, and then um, but it really gets recognized maybe a decade ago, especially because of the CBD and the seizures is when we really recognize uh, cannabinoid, the cannabinoid system as a therapeutic area to focus on. So there are 24,000 scientific articles on the ECS and related topics in the PubMed. Most of them are uh, in vitro or in vivo, tissue culture, or animal culture. However, there are dozens of clinical trials ongoing and there's certainly hundreds of clinical trials from the last decade that are now in the PubMed literature. Next slide. So it is important to understand, we've got all these letters, there are always three letters, which is typical. There's 131 at the last count cannabinoids in, in hemp oil or in cannabis sativa oil. So uh, there's other things in that oil, which we'll talk about later, but there's cannabinoids, which means they only occur in the cannabis plant. And these oils do not occur in nature anywhere else, but the cannabis plants. So there's 131 of them. The two that are most common and in the highest quantities in, in the plants are CBD and THC. But there's a whole bunch of others that are called the minors, that we will be learning about over the next couple of years. THCV uh, over there is the exact opposite of THC and, and re reverses the metabolic um, syndrome and has some very nice weight loss effects and helps with diabetes. CBN has been purported to help with, um, among other things, sleep and, and pain. Uh, so we're gonna see the CBC, a very exciting cannabinoid, minor cannabinoid, that specifically targets osteoclasts and osteoblasts. 
and so for fracture healing and uh, reversing osteoporosis. So all these are novel medicines. They are not working through therapeutic mechanisms that are available to other FDA approved medications. These are all novel effects using our endocannabinoid system. So it's very exciting. It's a whole new toolbox we're being given here. Uh, next slide. So nice to have the speaker working continually. Yes, it uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> so this is important, uh, the lock and key. So we, th this medication in many ways is like gabapentin. That's the, that's the closest medication I can think of. So you kind of understand what you're dealing with with cannabinoid medications. As we probably all know, gabapentin can go from 600 milligrams helps us to 3,600 milligrams. And the patient and the doctor work closely together over a period of months to find that dose. But it's a huge therapeutic window um, for using gabapentin. Well, gabapentin is a, lock, a key that fits in a lock. And um, so the cannabinoids fit into the endocannabinoid receptors. The, 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 the lock is the receptor on the cell membrane, and the key is the cannabinoid. Um, so the, the the treatment is going to require titrating from below the dose you need upwards slowly to your 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 sweet spot or your right dose. These medications uh, these uh, are they're almost all easy to use except THC. So THC is the tricky one for learning about dosing, and this is just an introductory uh, lecture. But if, you, if I do stimulate your interest in this new topic, learning how to dose THC with CBD or CBD alone, because you don't need the THC, is, takes some time and uh, some further learning. And I think Chris will explain to you what other learning is available. Um, so, but the, the effects are, uh, are immense. So let's look at uh, some of the things, mood and emotional responses. Uh, so anxiety and depression are, are two sides of the same coin, at least when it comes to the brain. And uh, the ECS is specifically uh, involved with um, both anxiety and depression through how we store memories and how we emotionally respond to memories. Very, very important. And that's why it's such a great medicine for PTSD. We have some good research coming out from Sue Sicily. It's going to be due out very, very soon on uh, treating PTSD. So the, this, this is a, a novel medication for treating PTSD. Um, uh, it, there are some issues with uh, adverse effects. And so we, we look at growth and develop learning memory, neuroplasticity. So in the pe people, um, young people, um, not, not even 18, but maybe even as high as 25, we really have to be careful with our dosing because there's a lot of plasticity of the brain that is impacted by the endocannabinoid system. The system is there to create neural connections. So we have to make sure we're dosing it correctly. And uh, what, what is the thing is so, uh, it's go, go start low start and go, low, slow. go slow. Yes. Start. Whether it's and, and then less is more, less is more. Right. We're gonna talk about dosing in a minute, but less is more when it comes to cannabinoids. Um, so I, so here we are, we're looking at a receptor and um, this is the interesting thing is it's a retrograde signal. So it's a fat soluble messenger and almost all the messengers that we're familiar with are water soluble and this is fat soluble. And so it is made on demand, immediately on demand in a nanosecond or a millisecond actually. So this is not like the water soluble vesicles that we're used to seeing stored in, in the uh, presynaptic membrane. This is stored in the po this is made on demand in the postsynaptic membrane and goes backwards. It's a break. I think we can go to the next slide. So we have two types of cannabinoid receptors at this time, and we will probably have a third uh, receptor. So we have CB1 and CB2. Uh, they are all of the receptors in this system are G protein coupled receptors, uh, similar to the other messaging systems. Um, and we have, uh, they're fat soluble, like I said, they go retrograde, they go backwards from the postsynaptic to the presynaptic and tell things to slow down. Um, the, C, the CB1 are in the nervous system 
Uh, that includes the brain and all the way out into our skin. So we have plenty of CB1 receptors all the way out into our skin from our brain throughout the entire nervous system out to our skin nervous system. And then the CB2 is in the immune system. So um, from throughout our uh, immune system cells, uh, liver and spleen. But more recently, we, uh, we can now say that there are CB2 receptors on every significant organ system in the body. Uh, and also very interesting, if a, if a part of the body doesn't have any CB2 receptors and is injured, it uh, upregulates CB2 receptors on the injured cells. So the body uh, makes CB2 receptors that are not usually there so that the endocrine cannabinoid system can go to work in that injured area. Uh, we need to highlight the bottom because this is really, really important because we're going to be comparing these medicines to opioids, to benzodiazepines, to other dangerous drugs. And, but you cannot die from cannabis. Uh, there are no cannabinoid receptors in that part of the brain that has to do with our cardio uh, respiratory pulse. So uh, be because we cannot have respiratory depression, there's no um, deaths from cannabis um, uh, um, overdose. However, you could get in a car uh, while you're euphoric and get into a car accident and die. So, we, you know, we need to be careful with THC, but it's, you're not going to have an overdose per se. Next it's slide. interesting. The next slide really illustrates that point. This is uh, direct. Uh, go ahead, Frank, to the next slide. Go um, ahead, Chris. Yeah. I mean, I just, this chart is almost that aha moment when you look at this is that that green line at the bottom, bottom, and this is from the CDC, so it is accurate data, and you look at that uptick of the opioid line, and then you look at the cannabis line, and you're going, okay, if patients are actually using cannabis um, to wean themselves off, or their physician or medical professionals working with them to decrease opioid use, well, that's a fairly safe option if there's zero fatalities from it, especially with what we know is happening uh, right now with the crisis that we have in the United States of just that, that huge upswing of opioid addiction, which Dr. Greg, I know with the Fast Facts title, you'll get into more detail um, here in just a few more slides. Thank you, Chris. I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this sort of reiterates uh, the 131 cannabinoids. There's two, CBD and THC, that are found in large quantities in the oil, in almost every oil. And then all of the rest, these are found in tiny quantities, um, uh, which varies from strain to strain. It is because of these tiny quantities, they're very uh, economically expensive to extract for therapeutic trials. There's very little research going on with the miners. However, we are going to see more and more research on the ones that I mentioned, THCV, CBC, CBN. It's already ongoing and there's a lot of motivation now that we're able to create strains with higher amounts of these miners. We'll see more research and then uh, and, and hopefully have more medications with different effects. Um, Novel effects, again, the, the, you know, treating osteoporosis and, and speeding up bone fractures with a cannabinoid is very exciting. Uh, reversing metabolic syndrome, another huge epidemic problem, entirely unrelated to all the other cannabinoids, THCV and its relative CBDV, both uh, are, are what I call the, the anti-munchies and, and are the exact opposite of the munchies. And they actually flip our switch in our hypothalamus and tell us that we're full, even when we're not full. So very exciting new medication and new, new effects. Um, on, on to the next slide. So not to be forgotten in all these oils, uh, so there's 131 cannabinoids, which are only found in the cannabis sativa plant, but there's hundreds of terpenes, which are found in all sorts of other plants, nuts, fruits. Um, and these are fairly similar in structure to the cannabinoids, um, and they help the cannabinoid fit into that lock and key we talked about earlier. So they, they help it fit in a little tighter, a little easier. Um, and so um, that we call that the entourage effect. The miners also help the uh, THC and CBD fit in better. So the miners work in the entourage effect and the terpenes work with the entourage effect. 
Hey, Dr. Greg, I don't know yeah. if you saw it, but this is kind of an interesting side note on the terpenes. UCLA just awarded or was awarded almost $4 million in a grant for terpene research. This morning, I saw that pop oh, up. Okay. So, well, that is great. And, and uh, th this is, I think what we've done with plants is we've opened up people's minds, which I'm we're hopefully we're doing to this audience, to the fact that we can make a uh, scientifically valid medicine from oils. We, we did it thousands of years ago and even hundreds of years ago. And then we sort of forgot about it in the whole monomolecule mentality of the pharmaceutical industry, which, you know, you have one molecule that's put, you know, 325 milligrams of aspirin in a, in a tablet. And so we are getting away from the monomolecule uh, approach, which we've used for at least 100 years. And now we're back to oils and combining them and uh, entourage effects that we used to know about historically. Uh, but so each one of these, they all have plenty of studies. If you go out to uh, PubMed, every single one of these yeah. terpenes has plenty of studies showing some clinical efficacy, uh, but, but not the kind of phase three, three trials that we're used to seeing. These are, these are yeah, not absolutely. high quality studies. We can go on to the next slide. Okay, so I've got to tell you, if I haven't said it already, dosing, dosing, dosing is the hardest part of using cannabinoid therapeutics. Um, so that's because we are dealing um, with a system that tends to up and down regulate. The, so the receptors, if they're overstimulated for, for too long or by too high of a dose, they start uh, falling into the inside the membrane and are not available. And likewise, if there's not enough of the stimulus, then th the membrane starts pushing out more of these little buttons on the outside of the membrane. So it's not just one size fits all ever with cannabinoids. But I can say that once you have worked with your patient and titrated up to the sweet spot, which is the right dose, that you pretty much can stay on that dose. So that's that patient's dose. Um, so it's not like it's a moving target. Once you get to the target, you pretty much stay there for the therapeutic regimen. Um, and there's lots of ways to give this medication. Uh, just off the bat, though, there's no uh, systemic, so there's no intramuscular or, or IV injections at this point in time. Um, so we're dealing with inhalation, which is the oldest known uh, method, smoking, uh, which is not our preferred way of in inhaling. We like inhaling v the vapor. So not just through a vaporizer, but there's ways you can, you can take plant leaf and put it into a plant leaf vaporizer and it takes the vapors out of the plant leaf without, without igniting it in any way or, or heating it up too much. It just vaporizes at a low temperature. So that's a nice way to get uh, this stuff inhaled into our lungs, which directly into the blood supply and uh, therapeutic effects in two to 10 minutes, maximum, maximum therapeutic effects in two to 10 minutes. So you have a back spasm, you have a panic episode, uh, you're having effects right away. There's not many medications I can think of uh, albuterol maybe that uh, is that well dr greg and i think that's an important point is that a patient can also self-titrate they can feel the medication going into their system quickly so that's one of the advantages with the inhalation which in historical context you, you know it's very odd to have your patient either vaping or smoking and you know there's the taskins study out there that shows that even um, smoking cannabis um, has a decrease in lung-related cancers, et cetera. So um, what we hear most often, I'm sure you do as well, is that the, the link, the ingestion, where we, I mean, we have a whole poster on an infographic, go start low, go slow. That's where people get in trouble. They have an edible and in 15 minutes, they don't feel anything. So they eat another five milligrams. Well, within two hours, they're having the worst anxiety experience they've ever had. So that's where journaling, um, making sure that how to medicate is a big part of the patient um, discovery with uh, the medical professional and patient journaling is pretty critical and we go into great detail on that with the medical cannabis handbook. Yep, yeah, very good. And, and so that, that what that you described is, is one of the most common reasons to go to the emergency room. Yep. It's called dysphoria and it's very, very unpleasant. You feel like you're going to die. Um, and it can last for many hours, up to six hours. So it's a really unpleasant adverse effect, but it is self-limited and it goes away no matter what in, in six hours. But yeah. um, the good, uh, good nursing and good education 
we'll make sure that that patient leaves knowing not to uh, double up or triple up on their um, oral medications, their ingested And I think we can go to the next slide. We go into a little bit more detail about those ratios. Okay, great. So yeah, finding the CBD to THC ratio. So look at these numbers over on the, on the left corner, 18 to one, eight to one, et cetera. So the, uh, the best medicine to start out with is the one-to-one -one ratio for most conditions, um, not the seizures and, and maybe not anxiety, but for uh, most of the other things we're gonna treat one-to-one. -one, um, and that, uh, that is what the Sativex is, which is called um, um, Nabiximols is the generic name is a one-to-one -one plant extract of CBD to THC. And so what you will notice is the only thing that goes up is the amount of CBD. So, so you know, we, we don't need much THC when, when it comes to therapeutic. Uh, five, 10, 15 milligrams per dose, maybe 30 milligrams a day, and that, that's a high amount of THC, whereas our CBD doses can go up into the hundreds of milligrams. So you're gonna, you, you are able to, uh, recommend these different ratios because they're available at the dispensaries. They know, okay, you need a four to one. Here it is on the shelf in a four to one tincture. So well, the other thing, Dr. Greg, to uh, interject is uh, we've talked about at length is that if you're getting high, it's too much THC. So THC isn't the enemy. It's that if, if you're overusing or, or having too much THC at a time, it's that um, that's where you can run into trouble. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that the mnemonic for that is if you're getting high, your dose is too high. Um, so, you know, we, all, we always like mnemonics in, med in medical practice. Um, and, and the reason why it's too high is in order for you to get euphoric, uh, some people use the word psychoactive effects with euphoria, uh, you are probably over stimulating the receptors. And so they're going to downregulate after a couple, day, a couple days of, of doing that dose. And, and what happens when they downregulate is you need to take more medicine uh, to get the same effect. So we don't want downregulation. We really want to slowly move up to the sweet spot and stay there. Um, okay, I think we can go on to, okay. Uh, a very important point is about CBD is uh, it's a negative allosteric, allosteric modulator. I just like to say that, that's, I, but uh, <laughs> It, it modulates THC. So THC goes, fits in the locks and lock and key and CBD from, from a few inches away uh, from the lock mechanism, not really a few inches, but from a little distance away from the lock and key actually pushes the key out a little bit. So it decreases THC's effects. So um, that's why we like to have plenty of CBD in there with the THC to, to modulate what THC is doing and to reduce the adverse effects. Almost all the adverse effects associated with these cannabinoid medications are from THC. So that's the one where we're gonna learn about anxiety, paranoia, um, uh, agitation, uh, dependency and addictive behavior, all are related to the THC. And uh, the other medicines are very, very, very gentle with, with wide therapeutic windows and, and mild adverse effects. Um, so here we go, side effects. Yeah. Um, again, this mostly has to do with THC. And these, you, you're gonna learn these because um, when you talk to your patient, you're, in order to find out how it's impacting their CNS, you're gonna have to ask them these questions because they're not all gonna tell you I got high, but they can tell you they had uh, some altered sense of time. That's a very early symptom of, of higher levels of THC. Uh, impaired short-term memory, uh, auditory hallucinations can happen early, and then with higher doses, you can get psychosis. It's a temporary psychosis, um, delusions, um, and then this agitation or dysphoria, which is very unpleasant. Uh, and then what we can do then is mo modify how they, they use their dose, and we can divide the dose in half, so it's twice a day. We can change it to sometimes you use the inhaler, and sometimes you use ingestion. Uh, there's, a, there's a million variations and all, all of these different medications made in FDA approved facilities are available at dispensaries. So these are high quality medicines with certified uh, good manufacturing practices, just like we'd expect from any medication are available at the dispensary. Uh, so you can have the patient modify their dosing and get to the right dose. 
And one of the things on that, uh, Dr. Greg, and especially in both uh, our courses, online courses, but also very uh, clear in the Cannabis Handbook, is how to read labels. You know, that's a big conundrum for a lot of medical professionals, just understanding all the components and how to make sure their patients are safe and understanding what that label really means. Yeah, yes, right. So there is, a, a, I think, a required QR code now on every uh, one of these there, products. Uh, yeah. And remember, the CBD products are over the counter and can be, people can be purchasing them at mini marts even or health food right. stores. We'll, we'll talk about that QR code. in an answer. I Sorry? have a question real quickly on the cannabinoid uh, hypermesis syndrome that, yep. that causes that violent um, you know, vomiting syndrome, basically. It's, cyclic, it's a cyclic vomiting syndrome, correct. Yeah, so Melanie had a question about that. So it, what there, it, there certainly is real. You know, we know that there's certain individuals that have a very quick and violent reaction to cannabis and cannabinoids and shouldn't be using it. Yeah, let's talk about that. So this is still a rare condition. It occurs in, uh, generally occurs in recreational users of high THC products. So back up above, when we looked at the ratios of THC to CBD, there was always at least equal or more CBD per THC. But uh, in the recreational uh, side of the dispensary, they have very, very little, often just half a percent CBD and then 20 or 30 percent THC. So that makes it a, a one to 30 ratio, one to 40 ratio. Those hey, Dr. Greg, yep. sorry to interject. I just know we're running a little bit okay. tight on time. So let's oh. get to the cannabis and opioids right. next. Yep, gotcha. So okay. But so, just stuff. so you know, uh, cannabis hyperemesis uh, syndrome is probably due to a, it's probably due to a fungal contaminant of, of, of high uh, recreational grade marijuana, and it, it it does occur and it's easily treated. Okay. Uh, so, cannabis and opioids. This is my ballywick here, um, and it's been my focus for the last two years or so. I think we all understand the importance and the epidemiology of. Of, of this, it is just recently, uh, the curve is just recently flattened. So this was a, an epidemic long after we implemented FDA and, and other CDC recommendations. It still didn't slow down until the last one or two years. We have plenty of epidemiologic data to show uh, that when you implement state laws with cannabis available, that there is marked reduction, 25% to 34% decrease in overdose doses in admissions to, um, for, uh, for toxic effects from opioids and for um, withdrawal and, and rehab. So we also have uh, epidemiologic data showing decreased prescriptions for opioids and benzodiazepines in the 17 states that have medical cannabis laws, and, and we can track this. So as the years go on, the effect gets stronger and stronger. Um, so th that is epidemiologic data, and let's go on to the next set of data. So then we have scientific studies. Uh, again, these have been hard to do, but they are available, and there's probably a dozen good ones out there now. Um, going back to, to 2010, 2016, but uh, here we're sh showing 64% reduction in opioid use and an improvement of quality, life, of quality of life when you make medical cannabis just available. There's no specific dosing was given. They were just, they had medical cannabis available and they prefer that over and over again, your opioid patient will prefer cannabis to a, taking an opioid pill uh, or a benzo. Uh, then when we actually start looking at specific dosing and inhaled cannabis vapors, so the specific dosing, we got uh, 33 to 44% reduction in pain. Well, what does that mean? Well, the cannabis does a couple of things. It, it actually, using the endocannabinoid system, it turns down our barometer, so how much pain we feel coming up our uh, spinal tracts. It decreases our perception of pain using the endocannabinoid system. Separately, it goes over to the mu opioid receptor and acts in allosteric mechanisms to, to make the opioids work better. It makes the opioids work about 30% better. So as soon as you start adding some cannabis to the opioid patient, they are quickly able to cut back by about 30% on average of how much opioid they need. So a very good start to opioid weaning and withdrawal. Uh, also, the, the next one shows the low dose versus medium dose of THC we had the same effect, that 30% effect. That's because once you stimulate the receptors, it has its effect. It, it, you don't need to give it more. It, it, it has its effect or it doesn't. You just need to give enough for it to have an effect. So very low doses of THC had that 30% effect. And uh, neuropathic pain, uh, the reason I put this here, 
the cannabinoids work in all types of pain. So fibromyalgia, excellent, probably the best medicine out there for fibromyalgia, but uh, you know, uh, sciatica type pain, neuropathic pain, myofascial pain, arthritic pain. Uh, and it works through various mechanisms, not just turning down the, 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 the barometer of, of pain perception, but turning down the inflammation and swelling that is occurring at the, at the pain generator, uh, turning down our emotional response to pain. And a lot of times when the pain becomes chronic, the emotional response to the chronic pain is more impairing than the actual pain itself. So it turns down, it makes the world a little brighter. Uh, uh, like it, it, It's like putting rose-colored glasses on. You're not high, especially with the CBD, you're not high, but the world just looks a little bit better and a little brighter and it makes the emotional response to the pain a less of an impact. Um, now there's the, the book, uh, it's over 1100 references, I believe on that, uh, the medical cannabis and opioids. And we're gonna have some opportunities for some specials at the end. So um, we wanna make sure we get to some questions. We've got those coming in. So I think Dr. Gray, we're gonna have to miss this. Okay. This slide and let's go to the pre-webinar question first before we jump into questions. Okay, you want to read that out? Uh, yes. Hang on, let me move the window. Question, I work with post-operative -oper surgical patients, many of whom have a diagnosis of cancer or Crohn's disease and use medical ma marijuana for managing their symptoms. We have found that patients who use medical marijuana as an outpatient are much more difficult to control their acute post-operative pain than those who do not. Like many places in the U.S., Michigan does not allow medical marijuana in the hospital. So what can we do, uh, what can we do on the inpatient side to help treat acute pain in these patients while still trying to minimize opioid use? And the second part of the question, is there a role for dronabinol, Marinol, to serve as a supplement to their outpatient cannabis use, even though it's not FDA approved for use for the use of pain? So we can quickly kind of address that because I've got a couple other com questions coming okay. in. Got it's a very nice question. And so uh, what's happening here is they've stopped using their cannabinoid. The opioid is not getting the allosteric boost of cannabinoids. And so they, they need, 30% more than they would have needed if they had the cannabinoids doing their thing. So uh, you, the uh, providers have to very closely manage their opioids knowing that, that, that for several days, four to five days, they're gonna need more opioids than they would have because of the, that there's no longer any uh, allosteric effects. I don't like Marinol, it's a very old medication. It is a synthetic THC analog. Uh, lots of euphoria associated with it, uh, addictive behaviors associated with it. It is a monomolecule synthetic, and uh, I, I think its days are numbered. Um, and uh, I think that's it. The other thing is don't forget that acetaminophen Tylenol works specifically by, uh, it's a pro-drug that turns into a CB1 receptor stimulator. We didn't know this until a decade ago, but so, Tylenol works through the endocannabinoid system. It only works through the endocannabinoid system and its pain relieving effects are using the ECS. So you, you can add your Tylenol up to the allowed daily amount. Great, thank you. I wanna to get to a couple other questions. I think we're there from Grace. Um, we previously stated that marijuana does not affect the cardiorespiratory function since it does cause, since it does cause rep respiratory depression but here it says breathing problems and stroke are chronic side effects. So they're comparing when we got to the side effects um, and just uh, some clarification on that. And where I'm yep. thinking Grace is, go, go ahead, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the breathing. So when you inhale smoked cannabis, 92% uh, of what you inhale into your lung are the same particulates that you'd have if you smoked a cigarette. So uh, ignited marijuana plant material is very similar in nature to ignited tobacco plant material. However, there are lots of research has not been able to find any increase in, in any respiratory tract in cancers. And that's because of the anti-cancer effects of the cannabinoids. Uh, that's the theory is that the cannabinoids are actually preventing um, so, but you don't want to give someone who has a, a lung condition, nine, you know, 92% of it is actually particulates that can irritate the lungs. Um, what was the second half of that question? Um, that on the side effects, uh, there can be breathing problems and specifically stroke or chronic side effects. Again, it's that THC that can really raise your blood pressure in certain patients that you have to really watch that dosing is yep. kind of my... So, 
Uh, I would say cardiovascular adverse effects are the are our are, are biggest concern with THC. We have a lot of cannabinoid receptors in our endothelial lining cells of, of our blood vessels. And so the verdict is still out. We don't we cannot say that there's an increased rate of strokes with the use of cannabinoids. There's certainly some suggestive epidemiologic evidence, and we you need to be aware of that and very cognizant uh, of our THC dose. And there, Dr. Greg, isn't it also usually patients that have some sort of um, condition, you know, existing conditions that you, you want to monitor like any medication? Um, right, right, exactly. So it's a relative, it's not even a relative contraindication. It's just, it's something that you pay attention to and you really limit your dose of THC. I personally think that 80% of all the therapeutic benefits of, of cannabinoids come from CBD alone. Right. And so if you can try and just use CBD alone, you're, you're going to steer away from almost all the adverse effects that I can think of. Okay, I'm going to try to get through. We've got a couple more questions. We're getting a little tight on time, but from Susan, practitioners are concerned about combining cannabis with foods like candies and baked goods because of the perception it feels less like real medication. So I think the question is, um, because it's a brownie or an edible or a mint or uh, a lollipop or a soda with, that's infused with cannabis, it doesn't seem like it's real medicine, but I think from what my understanding and the research that I know is that there's certain patients that, um, you know, it's, it's the easiest way to medicate. They might not be able to, um, you know, vape or, you know, that kind of thing. Do you agree? I agree. I think the edible, um, you know, high quality manufactured edibles, the more they look like a, a, a product and not something made in your, your kitchen, the better. Right. And um, labeled correctly. Packaging labeled, good. manufactured correctly, uh, the, the better, and uh, tested by independent test firms. Um, and uh, rem remember, you're going to get overnight dosing with, with an edible because it goes, uh, it goes through the first pass effect. It has to get, you've got six hours of dosing with an, an right. edible. You're not going to get with any other dosing method. There's so also a pain concept, relief all night. Yeah, a concept of microdosing right now that, that is, you know, I'm in a uh, Washington state that there's a lot of like smaller dose mints. So a patient can then self-medicate for anxiety is a great example uh, without having, you know, the smell of the terpenes that are associated with cannabis, um, but can just take a mint to, to monitor their uh, ailment. Okay, um, let's see. From Elaine, can patients with COPD use cannabis for pain management? Did I lose you, Dr. Gray? It's the only problem is the ignited. Did I lose you? Yeah, for a section. Yeah. I'm still so there. Okay. The, the so only problem is ignited cannabis material is 92% particulates, smoke particulates, and you don't want to give that to someone with COPD. Inhaled vapor is a beautiful thing to put into the lungs of someone with COPD. So the inhaled vapor, pure vapor from uh, the, the oils of the cannabis plant are a beautiful thing to put into the lungs of someone with the COPD or bronchi bronchiolar issues, but not okay, the particulates. Kidding. We've got a, quite a few questions coming in, so we may, um, you know, to all our audience, we will get those answered, but we'll probably have to do that uh, after and send those out to everyone because some of them are quite extensive because we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to see some of the specials that we're, op we're offering. And Frank, I'll kind of turn the floor back over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris and uh, Dr. Greg. That is always so informative. And every time I hear you speak, I, I learn something every single time. So uh, just a couple of points here. Uh, as we've been speaking, uh, Dr. Greg Smith and uh, Chris Nazarenus are the authors of the two books you see here on the screen, Fast Facts About Medical Cannabis and Opioids, Minimizing Opioid Use Through Cannabis. Uh, Dr. Greg Smith and uh, Dr. Kevin Smith are the authors. Um, you can find both of these titles uh, at springerpub.com. The title on the right, Medical Cannabis Handbook for Healthcare Providers. Uh, Chris Nazarenus, uh, who's been speaking throughout this webinar, is the uh, author and advisor uh, for that title. Both titles are 30% off. Uh, you can see the code MM411WEB, W-E-B, and uh, that can be purchased at springerpub.com. And uh, as well, we're thrilled to be able to offer the online courses from Chris Nazarenus's company, Medical Marijuana 411, at 30% off as well. 
notice that the code is identical. MM411WEB is the access code or the discount code. And you can go to Medical Marijuana 411 and use that code for any of the products on Chris's site. Uh, after this webinar, we will also be sending out an email that will include information about uh, these offers and a direct link uh, to them. Uh, Chris, did you want to add anything else about your courses? Uh, the, the courses, one thing to know is, is that they're truly interactive uh, adult learning online courses. So all of the endnotes that are cited for all the research, they actually are clickable. So you can open up all the research. So if you really want to dive deep into a section about what, st what the study refers to, you can get right to it within the course. So it's not like a PowerPoint presentation with a voiceover. It's truly interactive PDFs. Uh, start and stop at your leisure. You'll have a permanent student dashboard. Uh, we, you will get your CE credits, which is great. 10 credit course. Uh, for pharmacists, uh, physicians, nurses. So if you have other people that you'd like to share the code with, we're happy to do that. Um, and they were completely guarantee everything in the, all the years that we've been developing educational courses, we have a 100% guarantee and we have had no returns. People love the materials. Uh, I'd just like and to add something about the book real quickly, if that's all right. Uh, the, the opioid book, uh, and it's, it's also how to control pain, even if the patient's not on opioids, using cannabinoids. So it, it, uh, it's two parts to it. it. It's also how to wean and, and, and co-use opioids with uh, cannabis, but also how to use manage pain without, uh, with, with using cannabinoids. Excellent. Thank you very much. And then, Chris, if you could provide a bit more information about the infographics. So I think you saw with the little video in the beginning and some of the graphics throughout the presentation, when we created the handbook, um, we created these gorgeous graphics. And so all the, the main spreads of the, the book, we had so many requests for them that we created a series of infographic posters that have just been a huge hit. Um, so there's six 12 by 18 posters, four 12 by, uh, 24 by 18 and four 12 by 18. They're all the featured uh, images within the medical cannabis handbook, and we are giving 30% off those as well with the same code. So we thought we'd pass it along, and, and again, they've just been a huge hit, and we are seeing them all over Washington in the dispensaries. So it's not even the medical community, it's the whole uh, cannabis community that are really embracing the, the high-level look and feel of these graphics. Yep, thank you very much, Chris. So again, um, we will send out information about these offers in the follow-up email. We will also provide a recording of the webinar so you can go through it. And um, I just wanted to thank uh, Chris Nazarenus and Dr. Gregory Smith so much for providing all of this information. We truly appreciate it. It's been a, a, a true pleasure and a privilege to be partnered with both of you. I also I want to thank you. this wonderful audience. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. To this wonderful audience, it is probably one of the largest audiences we've had ever uh, in a webinar. It goes to show the tremendous amount of interest and uh, curiosity and questions around this. There have been uh, questions flowing in following um, the prime uh, part of our presentation, and we will uh, strive to answer those as we uh, provide you with the recording and the links. So thank you so much to this wonderful audience. Thank you to Chris Nazarenus and Dr. Greg Smith. And um, we will see you in our next webinar. So have a wonderful day and uh, goodbye for now.